This is Our People Podcast, telling the stories behind South Tyneside and Sunderland NHS Foundation Trust. Hello, I'm Fiona Thompson. I'm a communications officer with the Trust and I'm joined today by Vicky Bowmaker and Paul Bevan. And we are going to be talking about uh, the recruitment processes we carry out and how we look at putting a stop to fraud and uh, uh, what we do to carry out checks when people join us with the trust. So Vicky, would you like to set us start off by saying uh, a little bit about your job and um, your journey to your role today? Yeah, so I'm Vicky Bowmaker, I'm Recruitment Services Manager here with the trust. Um, I've been at the trust since 1994 and um, I actually started in the recruitment team uh, when I first arrived and I've had numerous posts in and around the trust so I've been in education and OD, medical director's office, medical education and came full circle returning back to the recruitment team in 2009 where I've stayed ever since um, as the recruitment services manager and um, so as part of that I manage the recruitment services team and the, everything that we do um, on a day-to-day basis and um, so the team we look after all recruitment um, including uh, medical recruitment, international recruitment. We also recruit for the two subsidiary companies, for Choice and Stickle, uh, which is Haven Court. Um, and we also onboard other staff um, who are not employed by the trust, such as non-medical agency and honorary contracts. We support retirement return, current employees with work permit renewals, and we also run trust headquarters reception, where we issue all the ID badges um, so there's lots going on in our It team sounds exceptionally busy. It does seem very, very busy. Brilliant. And Paul, you work with the Trust, don't you? Yes, um, I work uh, with the Trust. My name's Paul Bevan. I'm a Cambridge Fraud Specialist. Uh, and I work for an organisation called Audit One, uh, which is an audit consortium uh, who provides Cambridge Fraud and internal audit services um, to a number of, of NHS and non-NHS organisations across, across England. Uh, we are hosted by Cumbria, Northumberland, Tyne and Weir NHS Foundation Trust and as part of our role, uh, South Tyneside and Sunderland Foundation Trust is a member of our, our consortium. Um, my career started in counter fraud probably around 1996 uh, where I worked for Sunderland City Council doing benefit fraud, so criminal investigations of, of people who defrauded the benefit section. In 2008, I joined the NHS in Sunderland Internal Audit Services, um, which was hosted by the Trust here. And then about six years ago, we, we, the Audit Consortium within the North East combined and brought together under, under Audit One, um, and I've worked for them uh, ever since. So in terms of professional qualifications, I have a degree in Counter Fraud and Criminal Justice Studies, which I obtained through Portsmouth University, um, and my career so far has been primarily since 1996 in the criminal investigation of fraud but also the prevention, deterrence, detection um, and uh, raising awareness uh, for staff, visitors and external stakeholders. Sounds fascinating. What actually sparked your interest in investigating fraud in the first place? Just nosy really. I I mean I was brought up by, by my parents to to have values in terms of honesty and integrity and, and doing the right thing. Um, so that combined with a, a naturally sort of inquisitive nature um, just led me down the path to do investigations. Brilliant, that sounds just, it sounds like a fascinating thing to get involved in. Um, so when uh, people come to us, uh, when they have been offered a job, what happens once they are offered that position? and it's accepted by the applicant. Vicky, do you want to take us through the process? Yeah, so obviously once the individual's been interviewed and they're successful at interview, they would be verbally offered by the recruitment manager. Um, and at that point, the recruitment manager returns all the paperwork back to the recruitment services team. Once we've got that paper, we process what we call a conditional offer of employment. And that conditional offer of employment outlines exactly what we're offering you in terms of what the job is, whether it's permanent, what we're going to pay you, Uh, whether it's fixed term permanent and it'll also outline exactly what happens next in terms of the pre-employment check process. Um, The individual will be given an appointment to attend for pre-employment checks um, and they also need to go in through NHS jobs because we do process everything through NHS jobs now 
um, and the need to go in and accept the offer um, by NHS Jobs. Um, and once they've done that, they can then put the referee detail in so we can then start the employment check process. Brilliant, because I remember getting my uh, offer of employment and my appointment and I thought it was going to be grilled. But actually, you come along and you present all your documentation and your details and things, don't you, to our team? Yes, yeah, you literally just come to just headquarters reception and at that point we work with you to go through all the documents and all the forms that we need you to fill out as part of that process. Brilliant. And that brings us on to fraud. So as part of this process, what forms of fraud do we face um, and what do we do to, to carry out those checks? From a, from a wider NHS point of view, um, the Counter Fraud Authority estimate that the NHS loses in excess of £1.2 billion a year fraud. Um, and fraud can happen or, or can be perpetrated by anybody. It can be perpetrated by staff, by visitors, by patients, uh, by contractors and suppliers. Um, and there are a number of different types of frauds that we could, that we could look at. So in terms of um, prescriptions, so people can manipulate the prescriptions to obtain higher levels of drugs or medication. Uh, people can uh, provide false invoices um, for services that haven't been provided to the trust. Uh, people can put false timesheets in, so saying that they've worked a shift which they haven't worked or, or worked additional shifts um, or change the timing of the shifts. So instead of working eight hours, they put on that they've worked 12 hours. And we can also um, look at any type of fraud which in relation to recruitment. Um, so false identification, um, imposters, uh, false references, information which is false in terms of academic qualifications and things like that. Um, so really there are, there are a significant number of frauds um, which can be um, perpetrated or attempted to be perpetrated within the NHS. And, um Vicky, I don't know whether you want to take us through why it's important to consider fraud when we are recruiting our staff. I think we just, first and foremost, we just need to make sure that the, the people are the right people for the job, uh, that they're appropriately qualified for that job, and then it just keeps everybody safe. So our patients safe, our staff pay safe, our visitors safe, safe. We just need to make sure that the, it's the right person for the job. And so what, what ways do we come across when people are trying to commit fraud in, against us in this way? What kind of things would they put across? I know you've touched on kind of, you know, they might say they aren't who they say they are. You know, is, is, there, a, is there a variety of ways that people do this? And is it sometimes innocent? Is it sometimes with kind of... I think sometimes what we come across, more, well, most of the time, I think that what we come across is quite innocent um, in the fact that um, somebody might put a a to and from date on the employment history on the application form but that isn't what we then confirm from the employer and uh, they're normally a month out for example um, or a lot of the time we get people who can't find certificates can't find qualifications and we, the other one that comes up very a lot of the time is around change of name um, because a lot of the time people present with documents where passports in one name, qualifications are in another, because through, uh, for whatever reason they've decided to they've, they've change the name. Um, and it's about knitting all that together and making sure that we're, we're checking that we've got everything that tells us the full story about that person and their employment history so far. And so if somebody has changed their name for whatever reason, what would we ask them to do as part of that process? provide us with a legal change of name document um, and that could be um, a, a deed, a depot deed, um, it could be a marriage certificate, um, so there's lots of different ways that somebody can confirm that they've changed the name from one name to another. Um, and when your teams carry out these checks, what do they do and do they have any systems that help them out? Yeah, so we've got um, six employment check standards that we've got to check for everybody and that's irrespective of who you are, what job you're coming in to do, um, whether you're paid or whether you're unpaid, whether it's an agency worker, whether it's an honorary contract worker, everybody who comes through our doors to do something on this site is subject to those six checks um, and their identification, right to work, qualifications, professional registration, employment history which we normally refer to as references 
um, and work health assessment, which people probably mainly know as occupational health. Um, and we've got a couple of different systems in place. Our biggest one that we use is probably Trust ID, which is an identification verification system. Um, and basically it's a scanner that reads the security features in passports, for example. No different to sort of when you go through the gates in the airport and it brings your picture up um, and because it's reading the chip and that's something that we can't physically do without that um, piece of equipment um, and basically it reads the chip and the chip information then shows on a report and that should exactly match what's on the passport so if the passport says that you bore Omega and that's the photograph the chip should say exactly the same thing um, but we use, another, we use a couple of different systems, so we use an EDBS system, um, is probably our other big one. The occupational health team uses a system called OPAS, and that just helps us manage all the occupational health um, requests that come through for recruitment. Uh, and then there's other things such as professional registration, we always verify them against the professional websites. Um, some of the websites you have employer logins, such as NMC, which gives you a little bit more um, of a check. Um, and qualifications come with different security features um, that I'll probably not go into because Paul's no. next to us. No, absolutely. But you most, both your, your organisations and teams must know that you know the, the, the tricks that fraudsters might play or things that people might do to amend things. Do you, are, are your, your experts always looking for those little telltale signs that something isn't quite right? Yeah, I, I think the, we've just recently done a, 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 a proactive um, presentation uh, to recruitment staff in relation to what the risks are uh, within recruitment, what to look out for, um, when to raise concerns, um, either to the manager if it's not looking at criminal fraud or to the counter fraud specialists if there's a potential for criminal fraud. And if I could just pick up on a little bit of what, of what Vicky said earlier, in terms of the importance of considering fraud when recruiting staff, um, fraud can't be committed by mistake, certainly not criminal fraud, um, because it has to be a dishonest act um, with the intention of either obtaining a financial advantage or a gain, or exposing an organisation or an individual to loss, or actually causing the organisation a loss. Um, so when somebody makes a mistake in terms of dates and things like that, that probably wouldn't be classed as a fraud. Um, however, if somebody deliberately manipulates dates and things um, and hasn't worked for that period of time or hasn't worked for that employer, then that's a deliberate act which could um, suggest that there's more to it and, and potentially fraud. Um, and the, the, the real thing about why it's important to, commit it, to consider fraud when you're recruiting staff is because of the organisation that we work in. Um, if we recruit the wrong person, they may have access to staff information, really personal information, patient information, um, and that information um, will have a black market value and that data can be sold on the black market, which would be unlawful under the Data Protection Act, but also it would have a huge impact on the, in, on the individual um, if that data was manipulated and misused in order for them to to make a financial gain. Um, so that's why we do a lot of awareness raising, not just with recruitment, we've done awareness raising with um, finance, with estates and facilities, and really across the trust, just to point out what the fraud risks are and how we can mitigate them and how the trust can make their processes and systems as robust as possible to prevent and deter fraudsters. And I know as the communications team, we've had um, some input from you as well, which has been really useful. Yeah, I mean, we, we work a lot with the communications team and we work a lot with our HR colleagues because where a fraud or a suspicion of fraud can't be dealt with or can't be pro proceeded down the criminal route for whatever reason, um, we would always liaise with our human resources counterparts because the burden of proof on the civil uh, side which HR process is, is balance of probabilities, whereas on the criminal side, it's beyond reasonable doubt. Right, okay, that's a good insight, thank you very much. Um, and so, why does it take us so long when we put these checks in place? Um, so I know when there's a, you get offered your job and then there's a process that we go through, why does it take such a period of time? 
And how long does it tend to take? It really just depends on the individual um, because everybody's different, everybody presents with different um, information, everybody's got different backgrounds, people are going into different jobs, um, so some people will need a DBS check um, for the job they're going into, the next person might not need a DBS check for the, the work, the job that they're going into. Um, some people will need more occupational health intervention um, than the next, so some people might be just a quick paper screen, um, the next person might need a nurse appointment or a physiotherapy appointment, just to make sure that when they do finally start work that we've got the right provisions in place to, be, to make sure that they're supported at work. Um, and that can be something just as simple as um, for an office worker they need a particular chair to make them comfortable and at the desk. Um, so it really just depends. We work a lot with different, we work with every individually differently to make sure that we get them to the end of that process or most people to the end of that process. Obviously not everybody starts work uh, for one reason or another, um, but we come across lots of different scenarios and um, we've been helping a, a gentleman get ID documents um, who was through no fault of his own ended up um, homeless. Um, we've been supporting another lady trying to get our right to work documents from the home office because our application didn't go through. Um, so all of that can have a knock on effect of on, on how long the employment checks take. So there's lots of things going on at, all at the same time. Yeah. You're juggling quite a lot of tasks there. Yeah. Brilliant, because obviously people <clears throat> people go through these these checks, but there's there's lots of different avenues you need to go to to get person into work. Yeah, and some of it's really quite simple. Um, so some of it, the person will turn up, they've got all the ID documents, they've got the qualifications, they don't need a DBS, um, the, the straightforward from an occupational health, they've had one employer in the last three years, they're great, um, but then the next person might struggle with some of the ID documents. Um, the, the DBS, for no reason, might take a good while, but it might be because they've lived in different police force areas, they've changed their surname, um, then they might need an occupational health appointment, they might have had 10 employers in the last three years that we're trying to get employment confirmations from. So then they will obviously take a lot longer than, than somebody else. But it's really important to get that whole process followed and, and completed before yeah. anybody comes to us. Yeah. I think if I can pick up a little bit on that as well. Um, whether a process takes long or not is really a subjective thing, isn't it? But I would turn the question on its head really and say, um, would staff and managers and directors rather have a process that's quick or a process that gives them assurance that the right person with the right qualifications and the right background is actually being employed um, for that position because the consequences of employing the wrong person in that position may be really, really significant. Um, so I understand frustrations when there's a lot of pressure on NHS workforce and, and services but from my perspective, it's absolutely vital that, that all of the checks are done um, and that person is only appointed um, when all those checks are done and the trust is satisfied that that person is the correct person. And so what happens if somebody does raise a concern during this process? What happens? From a, from a fraud perspective, if somebody raised a concern with us, then we would um, investigate it um, to see whether there was any uh, evidence of criminal uh, action. Uh, most of our investigations are, are carried un out under the Fraud Act, um, which is a, a specific piece of legislation which deals with a lot of a lot of fraud related offences. So you've got fraud by false representation, fraud by abuse of position and fraud by fate to disclose information, which are probably the three main offences. We would also work closely with our HR colleagues um, if it was a member of staff um, to ensure that they were aware um, and it may be that, that the um, HR investigation and the criminal investigation would work in tandem. Um, we would never get involved in a HR related investigation. Our focus would be primarily on um, the criminal side. And if that individual was a, a professional, so maybe a member of the NMC or, or the GMC or something like that, um, then we would liaise with our HR colleagues and the regulation, regulatory body 
um, to see whether they needed to do any um, external um, investigations in terms of their professional conduct and fitness practice. And Vicky, what happens if something somebody raises a concern in your team? Is there a, a process they need to follow? Yeah, I suppose it's it's a little bit the reverse of what Paul's just said. So we tend to we would work with again the our um, our HR managers in terms of they would support us through that process, um, and then then we would go to fraud um, if we felt that was was necessary within the information that had been raised. Um, or we would potentially go to fraud direct, which we have done in the past when we haven't been sure about documents that's been presented um, and we've just asked for sort of further advice with regard to that. Because what kind of consequences do people face if somebody comes to us and they say they are who they say they are or there's something amiss? What, what's the, what are the consequences for that individual? Well, ultimately they won't get a job. That's the long and short yeah. of it. It's, a, it's an <laughs> yeah. absolute no. And from my point of view, the consequences can be um, even if they haven't got a job, but they've deliberately lied or, or presented a fraudulent application or a fraudulent document or set of documents to support um, a, a fraudulent application, um, then the criminal process can be up to and including prosecution. Um, the maximum sentence for fraud is 10 years imprisonment. Um, if somebody manages to evade the, the checks and obtains employment, then fraud is classed as gross misconduct, so the person will be summarily dismissed. Um, any salary gained as a result of that um, false documentation that's being presented um, will be recovered, either through civil processes or perhaps through criminal processes, such as the Proceeds of Crime Act. Um, so there are a number of um, consequences. Um, and then obviously, if, if somebody is dismissed or somebody is subject to criminal prosecution, and potentially that can affect uh, future employment prospects, not just within the NHS, but in the wider community. Um, and what can applicants do when they are going through this process? What can they do to make it run quite smoothly? So when we do issue the conditional offer of employment, we also send out a candidate guidance document, um, which sort of gives a rundown of the pre-employment check standards and what people need to bring in. But I appreciate it's really quite complicated, some of it, depending on what documents you've got, um, what documents you don't have, because obviously not everybody has a passport, not everybody has a driving licence, um, which obviously the, if you do have them, then they're the easiest ways to sort of start proving your identification. Um, and obviously if you're 16 or 17 year old, um, the probability is, is you won't be paying for utilities, you won't have a gas bill, you won't have an electricity bill. Um, and, and the same, I know we've already touched on this, but if you've changed your name, um, sometimes that can be difficult for people, um, depending on sort of how they've reached the name that they're, they're at now. Um, so we will, we will work with everybody. Um, so anybody who needs any extra guidance, what I would say is pick up the phone and speak to somebody in the recruitment team before you come for your employment check and we will talk through you personally what you can provide, give some examples of what you can provide, um, the easiest way to um, prove your address if you haven't got one already is to open a bank account for a pound. Ah, right, okay. So that's a bit Cheap, cheaper than a driving licence. It is much cheaper than a driving licence. Um, but we will work with people. The employment check standards are huge. There's lots of variations within that. 99% um, of the time, there's something in there that will fit everybody. Good, good to know. Um, and we recruit from abroad as well. So what additional efforts do we have to go to to make sure that we've done all these checks? Because I'm sure both of your teams have a, a hand in this. Yeah, so I think... It, and we just need to be clear that it, coming from abroad or not, you're still subject to the same pre-employment checks as everybody else. Um, the main difference is, is obviously you don't you can't hop on a plane and just come for your pre-employment check appointment. Um, so the, the checks are done remotely in the first instance. Um, we do work with NHS professionals for a lot of our international recruitment um, and they have um, agents in country who help support some of that. Um, process in terms of reviewing certificates, applications, uh, documents, etc. And then the individual obviously has to go through applying for a work permit, so that's another check 
that the individual has to go through um, via the Home Office um, and then when they arrive in the UK we will then ask them to present with those original documents um, before the start work. Um, I suppose the main difference from a, an employment check point of view um, is that the criminal record certificate obviously they won't have a DBS, we can't process a DBS um, because they're not in the UK they need to provide um, a certificate from the country uh, that they're currently working in or countries that they've worked in um, if they've moved around quite a lot um, and we obviously need to issue them with a certificate of sponsorship which is the document which will allow them to start the work permit process. Um, so it is more complicated, um, it's not as easy as just picking up the phone or asking somebody to pop in with the documents um, but we do get there eventually. Paul, do you want to take us through how your organisation can support that? Yeah, um, I mean, in terms of, I think it's important to emphasise um, that the scrutiny that somebody um, is subject to um, when they come over from abroad is uh, exactly the same as somebody who is uh, applying to work from this country. Um, there's a lot of international collaboration and uh, mutual assistance um, in terms of being able to uh, ensure that the qualifications that individuals have received um, within their own country or their country of origin um, is genuine um, and also that it matches with the respective qualification that would be required for the job um, within the UK. Um, so I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, so although the certificate may look completely different, uh, we do have ways and means of verifying with the awarding body or with the educational institution that that person actually uh, did go to that educational institution and was successful in obtaining those qualifications. Because I'm thinking that, that that must be extra complicated in situations where um, people come to us from, I'm just using Ukraine as a, an example, where there's there's a lot going on there, but these links already exist that you can you can look to to verify people are who they say they are and qualifications are what they say they are. Yes, they, there are links in order for us to do that. Yeah. Um, and in a kind of wider sense, if any staff member with us, I suppose any member of the public, has a concern that fraud is being carried out, what do they need to do? What's the right process? What What's the, the advice you would give them? Well, the, the, the process is to contact the counter fraud specialist. Um, so either myself or, or people who work within our team. Um, I mean, we have a vast um, level of different experience within our team. We've got, we've got um, investigators who are trained um, either by local authorities or Department for Work and Pensions. We've got ex-police. Um, we've got people who have um, been investigators within the CQC and the NHS Counter Fraud Authority. Um, so we do have a huge amount of, of um, experience within the team of, of dealing in, with um, criminal uh, elements of fraud. Um, so I suppose if you were going to report to us directly, then I would suggest that you ring us on um, 0191 441 5936 um, or you can send us an email at counterfraud at audit-1.co.uk. Um, if you don't want to contact, contact us directly, then contact um, Hayley Wardle, um, who is the Director of Finance. And she's in charge of the counter fraud arrangements that are in place within the trust. Um, alternatively, you can report direct to the NHS Counter Fraud Authority. Um, they've got a hotline, so that's 0800 028 4060. Or if you Google report NHS fraud, um, you'll get their um, reporting fraud um, helpline, which is cfa.nhs.uk forward slash report fraud. Um, we, we won't necessarily ask anybody's name. Um, however, we would ask that, that there is a route to um, feed back and ask questions because anonymous allegations are very, very difficult. We very rarely get all of the information within um, a single email. So if there's a route by which we can ask questions, that will be great. Um, the NHS Counter Fraud Authority is a prescribed organisation under the Public Interest Disclosure Act. So people should feel um, secure in the knowledge that they're not breaking any rules in terms of going outside of the organisation. Um, and if somebody does come to us with, a, with a, um, an allegation of fraud, we wouldn't tell anybody who that person is. 
um, that information um, is completely confidential. Um, so I would just ask people that if they do suspect fraud is being committed, um, then to report it. Vicky, I don't know whether you would kind of underline that as like, what advice would you give to a, a member of staff with us? And I guess any trust, it must be the same kind of process. What assurances would you give them that it would be looked into? Exactly the same process. Um, so like I say, if anything was raised by the recruitment team, um, we would work with our HR managers um, to look into that and it would be investigated um, as necessary. Brilliant, because I guess if you feel that something isn't right, you need to look to, to, yeah. to raise it. Yeah, and that's no different within the recruitment team. The recruitment team are looking at documents every day um, and they question documents every day if they're not sure. Brilliant. That's really reassuring. Um, I suppose from my point of view as well is that if you if you do report something and that turns out not to be a fraud, then that's fine. Yeah. There's no repercussions on staff. Um, and we would rather people came forward and we investigated it and found that it wasn't a fraud. And maybe we just need to change a process or raise awareness and things like that. Um, because for everybody who comes forward, there is a potential that there is a fraud being carried out, um, which we can then investigate and deal with. So it's better to check and make sure. Absolutely. Brilliant. Um, and Vicky, if people are interested in joining us, uh, where can they find out more about the jobs that we have on offer? So they can either go straight to the Trust website um, and have a look at the Work For Us page. There's lots of links on there. Or they can just Google Work at Sunderland Hospital, Work at South Tyneside Hospital, um, Work at Our Trust, um, or they can go onto NHS Jobs and search for the jobs direct. Brilliant, that's really helpful. Uh, thank you very much to you both. Um, I think that's really interesting. I hope people have learned a little bit about what we do and all these checks that are carried out and gives them a little bit of information about what to do if they have any worries themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Our People podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and check out our other stories. Hit subscribe to keep up with the latest and catch up with what we've been up to on our Twitter, Facebook and Instagram pages. Just search for our name.